Good evening, and thank you, Doug, for that kind introduction. I'd also like to thank Wharton for hosting this event today. You know, given the severity and the complexity of the credit crisis, I think it's essential that we have a vigorous dialogue to really understand the causes of the crisis, learn from it, and make sure that we can prevent these from happening again. And I think that the Wharton community is ideally suited to contribute to that discussion. So as a Wharton alumnus, it's really a privilege for me to be here with you today. What I'd like to do tonight is first establish a foundation by offering some prepared remarks, uh, briefly explaining what led to the crisis, why we had to go to Congress to seek unprecedented authority to create a $700 billion program, how we use that authority to prevent a financial collapse, and where we're now headed. But then what I really want to get to is a discussion, a Q&A. So I want to spend the most of the time on Q&A and, and hearing from you and having an active dialogue. So let me begin by reviewing very quickly how the financial system affects Americans and their families, every American and every American family. Banks, as you know, serve as the primary intermediary between borrowers and savers. Americans save for their futures and for their families. And these savings of individual Americans are combined and made available to other people and to businesses who need to borrow money for their specific needs. The financial system links millions of individual savers around the country with millions of individual borrowers around the country through billions of individual transactions. This extraordinarily complex but usually efficient system includes both banks, where you and I have our savings accounts, and non-banks, such as uh, financial institutions that provide credit cards and car loans and student loan financing. Now, this system has developed over our nation's history, and it is built on confidence and on trust. Savers, be they individuals or businesses, need to have confidence in the institutions and the people they entrust with their money. And because no single bank can touch every family or every business, banks must have confidence to lend to each other for the system to work. Now, with that background, let me briefly describe the fundamental causes of the credit crisis as I see it. The seeds of the crisis were planted during a decade of benign economic conditions, including low interest rates and low inflation. Financial innovation, which has served our economy well over the years, also accelerated. Investors gained increasing confidence in the effectiveness of new financial products to diversify and to distribute risks. With this perceived reduction in risk, leverage increased across our financial system. Underwriting standards for mortgages weakened as more and more reliance was placed on the value of the home rather than on affordability. Homeowners took out ever larger mortgages with little or no money down and little or no documentation of income. Regulators, investors, and homeowners all took comfort from the belief that home prices only go up. Now, as we have learned painfully, that belief was incorrect. To understand the consequence of that miscalculation, consider that the residential mortgage market in the US is an $11 trillion market. That's a big market to get wrong. With banks' highly leveraged balance sheets and minimal down payments on home loans, even a minor drop in home prices and rise in defaults can result in a big hit to banks' capital. Large losses can then threaten the solvency of financial institutions. Rooted in housing, this credit crisis is complicated by a number of related factors. First, home prices adjust downward slowly, in part because homeowners are reluctant to realize losses. Most homeowners would rather keep their home than sell it if they can avoid it because they don't want to take a loss because it's usually their largest financial asset. Second, this necessary housing correction, which is still not over, is setting the pace of the credit crisis. And this slow adjustment makes it difficult to value mortgages and mortgage-backed securities because investors don't know for certain where the bottom of the housing market is and when it will be reached. But investors are forward-looking. With the high leverage in our financial system and the large necessary housing correction, Investors quickly realized that the financial system had insufficient capital to withstand the expected losses from the housing correction. But the opacity of mortgage-backed securities and the difficulty in valuing mortgage assets meant that it was hard for investors to determine for certain which institutions were at greatest risk. So investors didn't want to be exposed to a failing institution 
but they were also unable to determine which institutions were at risk, they pulled back wherever they could. So a capital problem for some institutions led to a liquidity problem for all institutions. That liquidity problem created a serious risk that our financial system as a whole, both in the US and abroad, could fail. Now, Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke recognized early that there might come a time when the private markets would become unwilling to provide the necessary capital to the financial system to deal with the large losses from the housing correction. In such a scenario, only the federal government would be in a position to step in to support the financial system, to provide the needed capital to prevent a collapse. Although government leaders have numerous tools to deal with financial crises, there was no existing tool to provide capital to the financial system. Government intervention was not our first choice, as it often has unintended, far-reaching consequences. But it was a necessary choice. So we began contingency planning in early 2008. Now, the crisis deeply intensified in the spring of 2008. And our largest financial institutions came under severe pressure from deteriorating market conditions and the loss of confidence. In a short period of time, several of our largest financial institutions failed. In March 2008, Bear Stearns. In July, IndyMac. In September, we witnessed the conservatorship of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, the rescue of AIG, the distressed sale of Wachovia, the failure of Washington Mutual. Eight major US financial institutions effectively failed in six months, six of them in September alone. As a result, credit markets froze. The commercial paper market shut down. Three-month treasuries dipped below zero. And a money market mutual fund broke the buck for only the second time in history. The savings of millions of Americans and the ability of businesses and consumers to access affordable credit were put at serious risk. <clears throat> Recognizing the threat to every single American family, we knew the time had come to provide government support for the US financial system. On September 18th, we went to Congress to ask for unprecedented authority to prevent a financial collapse. To their great credit, Congress also recognized this threat. And just two weeks later, Congress passed and President Bush signed into law the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008, creating the TARP program. We worked hard with Congress to build tremendous flexibility into this legislation because the one constant throughout the credit crisis has been its unpredictability. Now, the stress in the financial system that I've been talking about is reflected in one of a number of different measures that we look at. One in particular is the LIBOR-OIS spread, which is a key measure of risk in the financial system. Typically, that spread is between 5 and 10 basis points. Higher levels means more risk. On September 1, 2008, the one month spread was 47 basis points. By the 18th, when we first went to Congress, the spread had climbed to 135 basis points. By the time the bill passed, just two weeks later, on October 3rd, the spread had nearly doubled again to 263 basis points. And credit markets continued to deteriorate. And just one week later, the spread spiked to 338 basis points, almost 50 times normal levels. Our nation was facing the potential imminent collapse of our financial system. So many people have asked me, what if the financial system had collapsed? What would have happened? Businesses of all sizes might not have been able to access funds to pay their employees, who then wouldn't have money to pay their bills. Families might not have been able to access their savings. Basic financial services could have been disrupted. The severe economic contraction and large job losses that we are now experiencing were triggered by the credit crisis. If the financial system had collapsed, this recession, including terrible job losses and numerous foreclosures, could have been far, far more severe. As conditions deteriorated rapidly, it became clear to us that we needed to use our new authority granted by Congress as aggressively as possible to quickly attempt to stabilize the system. Now, a program as large and complex as the TARP would normally take many months or even years to establish. But we didn't have months or years. We had to move as fast as possible. So we designed a capital purchase program to invest up to 
$50 billion in banks. It would be the fastest, most direct way to inject much needed capital into the system and restore confidence. But a big question remained. Would banks participate? Banks traditionally resist government assistance because they fear it could make them look weak and undermine the market's confidence that is so vital to their business. If they did not participate, our plan would not work. So we asked the CEOs of nine major banks to come to Treasury and meet with us on the afternoon of Monday, October 13th. And we asked them to participate in this new program. And to their great credit, they all unanimously agreed. Two weeks later, our investments were complete. This action, combined with a guarantee of bank debt by the FDIC, stabilized the system and prevented a collapse. In short, it worked. While we started with those nine banks, this program was designed so that healthy banks of all sizes across the country could apply. All banks, large or small, would get the same terms. In the seven months since Congress passed the legislation, Treasury has now completed around $200 billion investing in 579 healthy banks in 48 states, Puerto Rico, and Washington, D.C., with new investments each week. The investments have ranged from as high as $25 billion to as small as $300,000, and the median investment is around $15 million. Most of the banks Treasury is investing in are small community banks that never got involved in the risky mortgages that led to this crisis. And there are hundreds of additional applications in the pipeline. It is important to remember Treasury is buying preferred stock from these banks, not giving them money. Treasury has already received almost $3 billion in dividend payments, and I expect the vast majority of these banks to pay back the Treasury in full with interest. People often ask me, why are we investing in healthy banks? Shouldn't the TARP just be used for failing banks? Once we had prevented a collapse, our focus turned to minimizing damage to the economy. We needed to get lending out to consumers and to businesses. Healthy banks are in the best position to support lending in their communities by extending credit. If you have a dollar and you invest that dollar in a healthy bank, it is far more likely to turn around and make new loans than if you gave that same dollar to a failing bank, which will just try to survive. <clears throat> Treasury also helped the Federal Reserve establish a lending program to reduce borrowing costs for consumers, including auto loans, student loans, small business loans, and credit card loans. They are planning to expand this lending initiative to include commercial mortgage-backed securities and other asset classes. This program you've probably heard about is called the TALF, and it's now underway in showing real promise helping to restart the securitization markets that are essential to providing credit to our economy. Under Secretary Geithner's new financial stability plan, Treasury and the banking regulators launched a stress test of the 19 largest banks in America to make sure they had enough capital and the right kind of capital to continue lending even in a more severe economic scenario than we expect. The results of those tests are now complete and several banks are now out there raising meaningful new equity from private investors. That is good for the system, that is good for those banks, and that is a good indicator that markets are beginning to heal. Treasury also stands ready to provide additional capital if institutions need it from the government. As you may know, Treasury also launched a multi-part housing program to reduce borrowing costs and encourage long-term sustainable loan modifications for homeowners. And finally, Treasury launched a public-private investment program to purchase illiquid assets from banks, and that has received strong interest from private investors. Now, as you all know, during this time, we have unfortunately had to step in to stabilize several large institutions whose failures would pose a systemic risk to our financial system and to our economy. Let me be clear. We regretted having to take these actions to put so many taxpayer dollars at risk to support individual firms that had made bad decisions. But our choice was clear when the consequences of inaction so severe and the potential cost to taxpayers and to American families so much greater than the cost of intervention. Today, that LIBOR OIS spread that we track has fallen from a peak of around 338 basis points down to around 20 basis points. I believe the combined actions of Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and FDIC have prevented a financial collapse, but there is still a lot more work to do 
to get credit flowing to our communities. People have been asking, what are the banks doing with the money that we've invested in them? We designed important features into our investment contracts to limit what they could do with the money. First, we restricted dividend increases and share repurchases. And second, <clears throat> we imposed important standards on executive compensation. By increasing a bank's capital, we are creating strong economic incentives for the banks to deploy that capital profitably. Banks are in the business of lending and will provide loans to creditworthy borrowers wherever possible. If a bank doesn't put the new capital to work, its returns for its shareholders will suffer. People have then asked, well, how will we actually track lending activity? In January, Treasury began measuring lending, collecting data from the 20 largest recipients of capital under this capital purchase program, representing around 90% of our CPP investments. We've now published the first four monthly lending surveys, and these surveys show bank by bank the lending and, inter and intermediation activities of institutions by category, such as consumer, commercial, and real estate loans. These are all published monthly on Treasury's website. You can go look for yourself bank by bank. Now, it's important to remember, in recessions, credit levels and lending typically falls because both banks and borrowers get nervous about extending and taking on new loans. The survey shows that through Q4 of 2008, lending held up remarkably well, basically flat at these institutions, despite one of the most severe quarterly economic contractions in decades. I am confident to say lending levels would be far, far lower had we not taken these actions. Now, with investments in almost 600 institutions and hundreds more in the pipeline, we must ensure that our investments are targeted at helping the economy. But we must also take great care not to try to micromanage recipient institutions. However well intended, government officials are not positioned to make better commercial decisions than lenders in our communities. The government must not attempt to force banks to make loans whose risks they are not comfortable with or attempt to direct the lending from Washington. Bad lending practices were at the root cause of this crisis and returning to those practices will not help end this financial turmoil. The provision of credit that is vital to our economy will not materialize as fast as any of us would like, but it will happen much faster as a result of using the TARP to stabilize the system and increase capital in our banks. I like to summarize it by saying the bursting of the housing bubble damaged our financial system, which then damaged our economy. That recession is now looping back, further straining our financial system in a vicious cycle as Americans lose their jobs, they then fall behind on other types of loans, further damaging the financial system. The federal government has put in place extraordinary programs to support the financial system, the TARP, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and the economic stimulus package is designed to strengthen our economic fundamentals. We must attack the problem from both directions to break that vicious cycle, and that's exactly what we are doing. <clears throat> The current crisis took years to build up, and it will take time to work through. But I believe we have the right programs in place, and as they continue to ramp up, we will continue to see more progress. Thank you. Now, I'd very much look forward to having a discussion. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm happy to take questions if people have them, comments. Maybe you could begin just by commenting briefly on um, um, the tracks of your career that took you out of Goldman Sachs, Sachs up to the government. It would be helpful just to hear your background from the government service perspective. Sure. Um, I began my career as an aerospace engineer before going to Wharton. I uh, worked in engineering for a few years and then went to Wharton hoping to combine uh, engineering and business. I didn't know what I was going to do when I left Wharton. I ended up joining Goldman as a technology investment banker here in San Francisco as the optimal way for me to try to combine technology and business. <clears throat> had a great experience. I had always had an interest in government. And uh, when I was, I'd been at Goldman for four years, and I applied for a program which many of you may know about called the White House Fellowship. A uh, very prestigious program, very competitive. And the senior partner that I worked for at Goldman arranged for then Henry Paulson, CEO of Goldman, to sign a letter of recommendation on my behalf. This was in January of 06. I applied for the program, got halfway through, got dinged, 
in the regional finals. Some of you may know what that is. Was very disappointed. And by the grace of God, a few months later, President Bush selected Henry Paulson to be Treasury Secretary. So I called him up <laughs> and I said, you remember me? Uh, I had met with you. I wanted to apply for this program. If you're putting a team together, I want to come with you. I don't care what you're going to have me do. I just want to come in and I'll prove myself. And it worked out. I got very lucky. <laughs> I mean, it's a great lesson, you know, um, lesson for me and for all of us that I had my heart set on something. I thought it was exactly what I wanted. I didn't get it. I ended up getting something much, much better. Uh, and I'm very blessed for having it. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first question, on the stress test, how do you think that will influence regulatory exams going forward? Now, I know the government said this was sort of a one-time public thing, but just going forward in a private sort of way, how do you think it will affect the regulatory exams for banks? So let me, um, let me give some context and I will answer your question. I want to give some context for the, everyone else here. So the regulators in Treasury undertook a stress test, which I talked about, the 19 largest banks. There are already existing capital standards for banks that are established and that have been established for a long time. And what Treasury and the Fed did this time is they said, let's look at these biggest banks, these systemic banks, and look out over the next two years and say, if we forecast a more severe economic scenario than people expect today, Will the banks have enough capital? And will they have the right kind of capital to be able to continue lending through that more severe scenario? But they were very careful to say that they're not creating a new capital standard. So while they're not going to change how much capital a bank needs to hold three years from now or five years from now, I think that they've learned a lot about trying to apply a consistent view across institutions. Typically what happens is a regulator looks at, excuse me, with company management, an individual institution, looks at their loan portfolio, looks at their business, and takes a, a fairly narrow view of, is that institution sound? What this stress test has done is given the regulators a broader perspective to say, yes, is this institution sound? How does it compare to other institutions? What's happening in the broader financial landscape? So what I've heard from the regulators, I'm not, I was not a regulator, was they've learned a lot from this. And it's been a very valuable experience that they're going to incorporate elements of this into their more normal supervisory work going forward. Did I answer your question? Yeah, to make it more forward-looking. I, I think to make it more forward-looking and to apply more consistency across institutions. You know, they're, they're not only looking at what's in a bank's portfolio, securities, loans. They're looking at the earning power of the individual institution. They're looking at different macro effects. Um, th that's. OK. And the second question I had was, um, as you said, banks that received top were strong banks. What do you think the government will do when a strong bank gets into trouble? Would it be likely then that they would have access to more government capital because they're being deemed a strong bank? I think it depends on if a bank is deemed systemic or not. We segmented <clears throat> the world into two camps. Healthy banks, who we wanted to make even healthier so they could support lending, and systemic banks. If you have a bank that is neither healthy nor systemic, then we have something called receivership where the FDIC comes in and winds down a bank and sells it. Um, so I think it really depends on the situation. The other thing to consider is when we've had to intervene on individual institutions, the context of the financial markets and the context of the economy are very important. So look at Bear Stearns. If Bear Stearns had happened instead of March 2008, March 2005, when markets were normal and healthy, we may have had it reach a different conclusion. Maybe, I'm speculating, maybe we would have concluded Bear Stearns is not systemic in 2005. But given the fragility of our capital markets, we felt that we had to take the action that we took. So um, it's a complex answer to say that we look at each case individually in the context of what's happening around at the time. So there's not a reluctance to lose the top money that's already been invested? Well, I don't think that <clears throat> we established a standard, the healthy bank standard, where we said we want to evaluate whether or not a bank is deemed viable before we put any government money in because we didn't want to put money into banks that ultimately were going to fail if we could avoid it. Now, we've invested in almost 600 banks. I can't imagine we were perfect. I also don't believe that putting good money after bad is a good idea if the bank is deemed not systemic. I was wondering what the government's criteria was or pledge-based criteria in giving out enough money to some banks or even helping other banks get acquired with the government's backing, whereas some banks like Washington Mutual and Lehman Brothers, where 
So um, this is a very complex question. Remember, in the case of Washington Mutual <clears throat> and Lehman Brothers, the TARP did not exist. So let's, let's, let me take two examples for, to start with. Let's take Bear Stearns and let's take Lehman Brothers. In neither case did the TARP exist. The Lehman Brothers failed on Monday. On Thursday, September 18th, we went to Congress. So we couldn't have done what we did with TARP there because we didn't have the legal authorities. In the case of Bear Stearns, Bear Stearns happened very quickly in the matter of a week or two. It went from everything is fine to tremendous funding pressures to an, a near collapse. Treasury didn't have the legal authorities to intervene. The Federal Reserve has very powerful authorities to lend money in exigent circumstances. But the law requires the Federal Reserve to be secured with secured collateral when they make those loans so that they're not taking much risk. So in the case of Bear Stearns, there was a collateral pool of $30 billion of mortgages and mortgage assets that the Fed lent against. And that collateral secured the loan that they made. And that collateral was available. So they were able to loan against it. Now, after Bear Stearns failed, the markets, the expression we use is the markets turned their attention to the next slowest deer. Okay? The next slowest deer was Lehman Brothers. So Bear failed. All of the market's attention turned to Lehman. Lehman be started coming under pressure. And over the course of the next six months, if you watched their stock price, you looked at their CDS spreads, Lehman came under more and more and more and more pressure. Now, I was not in New York. I was in New York for Bear Weekend. I was not in New York for Lehman Weekend. So I didn't work on Lehman personally. But um, it is reasonable to conclude that as Lehman was coming under more and more pressure, whatever quality collateral they had, they were having to pledge to other private sector funders to try to keep themselves afloat. So after six months happens, and Lehman finally runs out of funding and is going into bankruptcy, or about to go into bankruptcy, there was no collateral left for the Fed to then lend against and meet their legal requirements. So Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke have spoken about this a lot and said very clearly that in the case of Lehman, it was not a question of will, meaning desire. It was a question of legal authority to take the action. Uh, in the case of AIG, they lent against assets. Then we got the TARP authority, which for the first time enabled us to put in equity or to really take a risk. And at the end of the day, this is about the government, the taxpayers, taking a risk in the financial sector. The Fed is lending money against secured assets. They're not taking much risk. The private markets were unwilling to take a risk. We had to be able to take a risk. That's what the TARP was about. So, so over the last year, you've determined that there are certain institutions that are too big to fail. And obviously, that's part of the rescue. As you look ahead, maybe five or 10 years, uh, one question that's probably being wrestled with now is, are these institutions too big to exist? And if, if you, as you look ahead, do you see what does the financial landscape look like 10 years from now? And hopefully, this is in the rearview mirror. I think that there will be large, there will be and there should be large regulatory changes that come about as a result of this. <clears throat> and there's momentum building in Washington for such regulatory changes. My personal view is I think we should take our time because these are very complex issues and we will benefit from getting the crisis behind us, studying it with the benefit of time to really make the right changes. You know, you could see, there, this is how complex this is. If you have some huge global institution that is systemically important, too big to fail, too interconnected to fail, then in a, in a sense, it will always be able to issue debt cheaply because the people who buy that debt believe that the government is standing behind it. So what do you do about that? You know, there are some people who are proposing that we should put a tax on all these institutions that are deemed systemically important to effectively increase their borrowing costs so that they no longer have a competitive advantage over institutions that are not too big to fail. You could call it a debt tax or a systemic tax. I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's the right answer. But I think that the regulatory changes that come out of Washington over the next several years are going to have a large effect on what the financial landscape looks like in five or 10 years or in 20 years. It's going to take a while. If you look coming out of the Depression, the massive changes in government regulations and in government agencies and institutions, it took a long time for those to all form and, to, and for the market to adjust to those new realities. So I don't have a good lens into what that's going to look like. I do know it's going to be different. In the back? <clears throat> 
You, t you talked about the TARP having strong protections on executive compensation. Uh, how does AIG figure into that? Wouldn't there $400 million worth of bonuses paid out there? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the bonuses paid in terms of AIG, which got so much attention, were entered into in ironclad contracts in the spring of 2008, six months before or longer before the federal government got involved in AIG. Now, we didn't have the legal authority to tear up contracts. Right? We're a country of laws. The sanctity of contracts is the bedrock of our capitalist system uh, that is really differentiated the U.S. relative to other countries that investors could invest in. Now, I talked about something called receivership. When an individual bank fails, a, a, a small bank, a thousand little banks failed in the SNL crisis in the late 80s or early 90s, the FDIC comes in and puts the bank into receivership. And that is a legal framework under which the FDIC can then uh, repudiate contracts, can decide, we're going to pay this contract, we're going to pay you this amount or this amount, we're going to honor these, we're not going to honor these. For these large global institutions like AIG or like Citigroup that are these big global bank holding companies, there's no receivership authority. So one of the things that the, new, the current administration is asking for, and Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke asked for it last year, was new authority to put these big global bank holding companies into receivership to give us these tools. The problem with having to intervene to stabilize an institution when you don't have these legal authorities, you don't get to pick and choose which contracts you want to honor. Because if we want, went into AIG and said, we're going to just arbitrarily tear up certain contracts because we'd feel like it, those creditors could then put the company into bankruptcy. They'd have a legal ability to do that. And that would undermine the very stability that we're looking to achieve. So we did put in place strong executive compensation requirements. Congress passed part of the TARP legislation required us to. Uh, but again, it did not go back and retroactively try to change contracts because our, our system is built on the sanctity of contracts. Other questions? We uh, work closely with ABS funds trying to raise capital uh, for investment in vintage MBS securities. Um, one question that we typically face from investors is the bedrock of an investor confidence is usually placed within the pooling and services agreement that was entered into. And uh, with increasing activity in the loan modification space, uh, it's becoming very unclear <coughs> as to how investor interests are protected while borrower loans are actually modified. And uh, what do you see as a, sort of a roadmap to protect investor um, interests in securities investment that they entered a long time ago, but their loans are mo being modified at the back end? And uh, you know, we know that the investors can be anywhere in the, in the globe right now, not just in the US. Sure. Um, and just to give some context for everybody, <clears throat> So all these home loans are packaged up into mortgage-backed securities. You have your different tranches, AAA all the way down. And there are these pooling and servicing agreements which tell the servicers who collect your loan payments how you're supposed to interact with the borrower. So if a borrower falls behind, here's what you're supposed to do to try to maximize cash flow. Now, the servicers are trying to maximize cash flow for the investors in the aggregate. They're not supposed to be picking and choosing which tranche of investors to be favoring. They're supposed to be acting on behalf of all of them. The loan modification programs that have been designed that I've worked on are designed to try to help homeowners who want to stay in their home and have a reasonable chance of staying in their home. Some people bought homes they could never hope to afford. And modifying their mortgage is not going to help them. It's not going to be good for investors. So these loan modification programs are designed to be very targeted to help those homeowners who want to and can fundamentally afford a reasonable mortgage. The analysis that we've done suggest that those type of loan modifications are in fact in the interest of the aggregate of investors. Now there may be some investors, depending where they sit in the capital structure, they may prefer a foreclosure. Okay? But the investors in the aggregate, if someone can afford to make a reasonable payment, that is better for the investors in the aggregate. So we've designed this on the front end to take investors' views um, into account. The interesting thing though is some of the minority investors who let's say prefer foreclosure are very loud. Right? And they squeal a lot, and they, they threaten servicers, and they say, don't you dare modify those loans. Put them into foreclosure, or we're going to sue you. And so by getting the industry to move and, at once, and getting the federal government to come in and support a view of helping 
targeted homeowners who want to stay in their homes, where it's in the investor's collective interest, we think that that's striking the right balance and stopping short of abrogating contracts. Other questions? <clears throat> Pardon me, I have a little bit of laryngitis, so I apologize. Um, getting back to the stress tests a bit, um, when we talk about sort of what the assumptions were for the worst case scenario, some of the things that I've read have kind of put us sort of not potentially not beyond that, but certainly on a path to go quite far beyond what was originally predicted as sort of the worst case stress scenario. And I'm wondering, you know, is there a plan C? You know, what happens if employment exceeds 8.9% and real estate doesn't find a bottom and the commercial real estate problem is much larger than, you know, it's kind of an unknown right now. And, you know, 1.8 million subprime mortgages almost brought the banking structure to its knees and we've got 8.1 million all day starting to reset the end of this year. And, you know, what, what's sort of the case beyond the stress test case and, and where do you see that bringing us, you know, as a country? So it's interesting because there certainly are some commentators who say the stress test was not uh, pessimistic enough. But a lot of the banks say, are you kidding me? This was far more aggressive than we think is uh, credible given what they're seeing in their loan portfolios. So I don't think you're going to ever make everybody happy. Um, and, and so we, I think Treasury and the regulators tried to find the right balance. The biggest risk we now face is a political risk. If the economy stabilizes the way the, economy, the optimists think it will, where we could see GDP growth as early as Q4 bottoming sometime this year, I think we're going to be fine because I think that that vicious cycle, it will be broken and it'll, it'll start to unwind. And the programs that we have in place will be appropriate given the economic fundamentals. If the economy deteriorates much, much further than we expect, then I think we may need to go back to Congress to get additional authorities to stabilize the financial sector and to continue to get lending going again. And that's going to be tough because right now the political environment is so bad. Almost every member of Congress is saying, don't come anywhere near us right now, asking for more authority. Now, I, I certainly hope it doesn't come to that. And again, many economists don't think it will come to that. Uh, if the recession gets much, much worse, the American people will feel it. And that's why we did this. We did this for American families. And members of Congress will feel it, and they will hear it from their constituents. Again, I was very skeptical in the two years I was in Washington at Congress's willingness to move and take uh, unpopular action that was necessary. But look what they did. When the people spoke and when we faced the crisis in the fall, they acted in just two weeks. If the economy gets substantially worse, I think Congress will need to act, and they will act. Is there a point at which it's like not better to keep putting them in the banking system? Or is that always the right answer? I mean, I guess the question is if we don't do it, it credit is, people describe credit as the lifeblood of our economy. If we are not able to provide credit, if our financial system is not functioning, we will have a deeper, longer recession than we need to have. And that's the choice we have to ask ourselves. Do we want to, even this is as distasteful as this is, would we rather have a longer, deeper recession? I think most people would say no. So I've got uh, two, quick, two quick questions. The first one is Americans have been encouraged by the administration to go off, refinance, take <coughs> advantage of um, the, the lower interest rates. The problem is, as you alluded to earlier, um, appraisals come in lower. There's been, there's been a decline in the prices. So you effectively, it's kind of like two-sided. You know, You can get better rates, but you have to pump more money into your property to maintain those rates. And I'm wondering, like, what, um, if anything, um, you think, whether it's the administration or something should be done about that, because I think that's kind of a, a tension. The second question is, um, I saw your interview on Charlie Rose. I thought it was great. I'm just curious um, why you left government and what you're planning to do next. Sure. <clears throat> so the first question is about underwater borrowers, which has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, you know, I, for <clears throat> in August of 2007, so I've been at Treasury for a year, Secretary Paulson asked me to lead the department's work on housing. So I looked at, with the, with the department and with the Fed, dozens and dozens of uh, homeowner programs, housing programs, foreclosure programs. And the issue of what to do about people who are underwater is a really tough issue. Because when people get way underwater, they may not want to stay in their house anymore. So I always talk about wanting to help people who want to keep their home. Okay? If you're underwater and you don't want to keep your home, people like to do this analysis. Let's say you call up your bank and you said, hey, look, I'm underwater. If you don't cut my principal, reduce my mortgage balance, 
I'm going to walk and you're going to have a foreclosure. That seems like that's a bad trade for the bank. The bank should cut your principal because maybe they're only going to get 60 cents on the dollar in foreclosure. The problem is moral hazard because if you do it, every one of your neighbors is going to pick up the phone and say, hey, cut my principal too. I'm going to walk. If you don't cut my principal, I'm underwater. And that moral hazard problem, the banks would rather lose you to foreclosure than modify every home on your street because the economics are better to lose you to foreclosure. So the underwater problem is something economists love to talk about but they haven't thought through the practical implications of if you own a bunch of loans, how you modify them, which ones you modify them. The hard part about housing is, again, targeting the assistance to the homeowners who need it, who can benefit from it, without creating the wrong incentives for all the other homeowners on your block, or without providing that assistance to the banks and the mortgage-backed securities investors rather than to the homeowners who need it. So you've identified a huge problem that I've not heard a good solution for. One thing that this administration has done <clears throat> is if you happen to have a Fannie or Freddie loan, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loan, typically you need to have 20% down to get a, a Fannie or Freddie loan. But you, let's say you have a Fannie Mae loan today, and you're now at 100 LTV. So you were in at 80. Your home has lost 20% of its value. You're now at a 100 LTV. Fannie Mae already owns your risk. So what the administration has done is said, look, if you're already a Fannie Mae loan, Fannie Mae can now refinance you up to 105 LTV. It's not increasing the risk of the government because they already own the loan, but it's enabling you to achieve a lower interest rate, which actually lowers your risk. So that's a clever, narrow area where we could try to address this problem. But beyond that, I've not heard a good solution uh, to that. Uh, in terms of why I left government, I was an appointee of the Bush administration. President Bush and Secretary Paulson appointed me. So my term was due to expire on January 20th with all the other uh, Bush appointees. The Obama administration uh, and Secretary Geithner asked me to stay for a brief period to help with the transition. It ended up being a lot longer than I expected. <clears throat> and I concluded my service on May 1st when my successor was announced and had then come into Treasury and we transitioned for a few weeks. So it's, I mean, three years in Treasury was a long time in this period. And uh, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to taking some time off and then re-entering the private sector. I have no idea what I'm going to do yet. A couple of questions. Somebody had asked about the commercial markets, uh, which <coughs> effectively collapsed. It just hasn't been um, visualized yet because uh, people are still hanging on to their properties. So what do you see as the government's uh, uh, attempts to shore up the commercial market the way they have the residential market? And then secondly, if you could just comment on your views of how all this funding and infusion of capital is going to affect inflation. The second one's hard. <clears throat> um, the first one r regarding the commercial mortgage market, that's an area of stress that a lot of people are pointing to as the next shoe to drop, so to speak. And you know, commercial mortgages and commerce is very tied to our macro fundamentals. So if our macro economy comes under a lot of pressure, it's common to expect that the commercial market is going to come under pressure. The best tool we have right now, the most promising tool, is this program I mentioned called the TALF program, where the Fed is going to be extending, likely going to be extending the duration of the lending that they're going to provide, the loans that they're going to provide to commercial mortgage-backed securities. One of the big challenges right now is not just um, people falling behind on their commercial mortgages, it's rollover risk. People who need to refinance, but the markets are frozen right now. So as we get this TALF program expanded, we think that that can really help restart the commercial mortgage-backed security markets. We announced the TALF program in November. <clears throat> it's a very complex program, and it took four or five months to get up and running. It started functioning in March. But even at program announcement, we saw markets react in anticipation of the program. And we're starting now to see securitization markets begin to show some thawing. I think this month, they did 10 billion of transactions. The previous month, we'd done three. That's focused on new. I agree. But, there's, but we, if you look at the Treasury announcements, they're focused on two things expanding to include other new asset classes, including commercial mortgage-backed securities, which could be refinances of existing commercial mortgages, as well as something we call legacy TALF, expanding TALF to include legacy mortgage-backed securities, including both residential and commercial. That's not going to help the individual. Expanding TALF to legacy is not going to help the individual property owner, but expanding TALF to new commercial mortgage-backed securities will. And so we think both of those in com a combination will help to restart the market. All of this is about trying to get private capital flowing back into these markets.
And again, I think we're seeing some early signs of progress, but it's still very early. Oh, inflation. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I would have to defer to my colleagues at the Fed. There's no question inflation is a risk anytime the government is spending so much and borrowing so much. But I think given where we are, our economic fundamentals, I think our, the choice is pretty clear, that we need to do what we're doing in the financial system and the economy to get through the crisis, and then we need to unwind our programs in a prudent manner once we're through it. Right now, if we have to err, I would err on the side of being more aggressive rather than less aggressive. Let's get through the crisis. Let's put the fire out. Let's be sure that it's out. And then let's deal with our longer-term fiscal situation, which is very important. In the back. Um, the idea of leverage was kind of demonized in the middle of the credit crisis. And obviously, leverage has its pros and cons. So I wanted to hear how you think about what's appropriate and wise. And then a second question is uh, opportunities for MBAs and federal government going forward. And what do you think of that? <clears throat> so leverage has been demonized. I think that few people would argue that some of our largest banks had too much leverage, non-banks in particular had too much leverage. I also think there is too much leverage across our financial system. Uh, individual Americans didn't save enough, had too much leverage. I think that the, the illness or the symptom of too much leverage manifested itself throughout our financial system. And I think it's hard to argue that there was not too much leverage. And we're going through a deleveraging process right now. And where we settle, this new equilibrium is going to be very important in terms of what our economy looks like in the future. We don't know where it's going to settle right now. Savings rates have gone way up from way up. It's still only 4 or 5%, but it's way up relative to where it was just a year or two ago. So I think that you know, leverage, you're right, has a role to play. It's not we should all have no leverage, but it needs to be prudent and it needs to be rational. Did I answer your question on leverage? Yeah. Okay. And Do you have any more specifics? You know, I, I don't because it's so situation specific in terms of individuals, in terms of banks, in terms of non-banks, et cetera. It's hard, to, it's hard for me to generalize. Um, in terms of MBAs in government, you know, I was very, I didn't know what to expect when I got to Treasury. You know, I came from the private sector, both as an engineer as and a banker, and as a banker. And I think I had an expectation that people don't work hard in government, which couldn't be further from the truth. People are working very, very hard um, day in, day out, not just because of the credit crisis, but now in particular the last couple of years. You know, we at Treasury, in the Office of Financial Stability, Treasury is a policy department. So it makes, it writes papers and it writes policy proposals year in, year out. It's not an investing uh, department. So we had to build this from scratch. So the TARP legislation created something called the Office of Financial Stability, which I ran. And I was the first employee of the office. In the last six months, we hired around 135 or 140 people, full-time people, dedicated to financial stability. We hired people from within the government, um, out of schools, from the private sector, from banks, from consulting companies, from law firms, all people coming in, trying to help out, do whatever they could to try to make our program successful. So I would encourage folks who are interested in government to look. It doesn't have to be at the federal level. It could be at the state or local level. I think you, there are great opportunities to take on large responsibility early in your career, to really be a part of something important. And I think you can develop good skills that I do think are transferable back to the private sector. I surely hope they am. They are. Um, <laughs> but, but I would encourage it. And I think that uh, figure out what you're interested in and you know, go to their websites, you know, meet people who are in government, et cetera, and, uh, and, and try. About 30% of the, the TARP funds that have been deployed so far uh, have been invested in Citi and B of A, if I'm correct, about $90 billion. Can we reasonably expect that to be repaid? Um, and do you have a time frame, roughly, you know, how, how long that will take? And can TARP be profitable for the taxpayers if that doesn't happen because it's such a huge portion of TARP? <clears throat> you know, it's not, let me, say, let me say it this way. I don't think it's appropriate for me to speculate about individual institutions. <clears throat> I will say that when we have had to intervene to stabilize individual institutions, the money that we've invested, those have been higher risk investments than, we've, than when we've made the more gen general investments in these hundreds of banks. So AIG is in that category, General Motors is in that category, Chrysler is in that category, as well as B of A and Citi. I think that 
If you look at those two institutions, those were part of the stress test. The regulators have gone through, analyzed their balance sheets, analyzed their capital positions, and have given them feedback in terms of what additional capital they need to raise. So I think the way we're going to get paid back as much as possible is by banks and institutions earning money over the long term and paying back the money over the long term. I can't put a time frame on when institutions are going to pay us back. About a dozen small banks have already paid back the TARP, and many other banks are applying right now. For those big institutions, it's hard for me to say when and in what form. You know, in the case of Citi, this is all public, we have uh, announced that we're going to enter into an exchange offer and convert some of our preferred stock for common stock. And Treasury is in the process of developing policies on when it would then sell that common stock. And so there are a lot of variables as to what happens in the broader economy, what happens to the institution, what happens to the banking market, to try to forecast when and for how much. Okay. Others? You mentioned uh, early on in your talk that there were, uh, you were reluctant to act uh, in the crisis because there are often unintended consequences of those actions. I wonder, we, someone already mentioned inflation, but are there any other unintended consequences that you're sort of seeing uh, in the market or maybe five or 10 years from now? <clears throat> One of the biggest ones that I'm concerned about, uh, I don't see it yet, but I'm concerned about is we want the TARP to be temp temporary and to wind down after a few years uh, once the markets are stabilized. If you look at the Great Depression, and housing was part of the problem in the Great Depression, four major government agencies were created coming out of the Great Depression. Fannie Mae, FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, the Federal Home Loan Banks, and the Homeowners Loan Corporation. Three of those four are still in existence today, and no one in the 1930s could have predicted that Fannie Mae would pose a systemic risk to our country 80 years later. So we certainly hope that the TARP and the Office of Financial Stability is a temporary program that is wound down soon after it's, it's run its course. But you never know, and that's a risk. Also, if you look at what we've had to do in the auto companies, it's nothing we wanted to do. We wanted in December for Congress to act. Uh, Congress was working on legislation to try to deal with the auto companies. The TARP was focused on the financial sector. It was not the right vehicle, but we were forced. Congress knew we could act, frankly, and so they didn't take the, the hard measure to pass their own legislation, and we were forced to act given how perilous the broader economy was at the time. It's not impossible to envision with this type of an authority that it could be misused to stabilize favored industries that may not be systemic. That's something else I think we should be very careful of and to try to design against and prevent that from happening in the future. So again, I'm not seeing it yet, but those are things I worry about. Other questions? Um, one of the uh, cornerstones of the uh, American dream is obviously said to be owning a home, right? And do you, do you really uh, feel that that's still the case, given all the uh, uh, things that have happened in the housing sector? Is it, is it still a meaningful dream for everyone to have a, have a home? I don't, I don't think the, that dream is for everyone. And I think that the, the experience of the last couple of years proves that out. If you look at, I can't remember the number, but if you look at the percentage of Americans owning homes, it had been fairly stable for many years and then it climbed up in recent years. And homeowners maybe who should not have been owning homes but who should have been renting were getting into the market. And so I think that there is a balance uh, that needs to be struck. And I don't think it's necessarily for the government to say, this is the percentage of Americans that should own their home. But I also don't think it's realistic to think that everybody is going to have the financial capacity to own a home. I think clearly some people need to be renters. Um, and that may change. You know, People may rent and own in different parts of their life. How are we doing on time? OK. Right here. I'm in the mortgage industry. And um, a lot of this upheaval in the market started you know, when you started coming up with creative mortgage products in the past few years, started doing zero down loans and that kind of stuff. And it led to this collapse. What makes you think this is not going to happen again when you've got FHA still doing loans with 3.5% down? borrowers with credit score that just now became 640 and until a month ago was zero FICO could get a home. Aren't you creating another wave of the same because some of the banks that you're lending money to are adding a second loan behind an FHA and letting a borrower buy a house with half a percent down? So what is there to check that something that started and has resulted in this is not going to happen again? 
<clears throat> so let's unpack what you just said, because there's a lot in there. FHA, Federal Housing Administration, provides loans, makes loans to Americans with as little as around 3% down. Three and a half. I thought it was three. Not changed. Changed to three. Changed to three. Okay. Um, and people would argue that that's risky, and that's a fair point. The point of FHA is to try to provide, especially for home, first time home buyers, the ability to get in to buy a house. And people legitimately say, gee, isn't that risky? That's a fair point. <clears throat> so we are taking risk as people are buying new homes, their first home. At the same time, we have to strike a balance here because if we raise underwriting standards so high, that people, most people cannot buy homes, it's going to put even more pressure on the mortgage markets. One of the things we had to do last year, we spent a lot of time last summer designing programs to stabilize Fannie and Freddie. That was absolutely essential because we needed to keep credit flowing to the housing market. We have a necessary housing correction. Home prices need to adjust back down to where ordinary people with regular jobs can afford to buy a home in their neighborhood. Okay, it's fundamental affordability. That that could be an overcorrection or it could be a very disorderly correction if the flow of credit to the housing market dries up. And if you own a house, but you can't sell it because no one can afford to get a loan, what's the value of that house? It ends up plummeting. And so ensuring that the government was there to provide credit to keep the housing market functioning was very important to allow the correction to progress while trying to minimize damage to the economy. So I take your point on FHA. Having said that, if you look at virtually every private sector source of finance, housing finance, underwriting standards have taken off. Okay, you don't see that? Well, because on your toxic assets, you know, you bought um, loans that originated before March of 08, right? Okay. That's what we're buying with TARP funds. Until January of this year, if you've got a lender like V of A lending without any income documentation, you've got the same problem that's going to happen or manifest three years from now. Well. I have to defer to you on whether B of A or any other lenders were offering no no doc loans in January of this year. Until January of '09, January 17th of this year. This is, I mean, I'll just be candid with you. I've heard the complete opposite from everyone else that I've spoken with, including the banks, including people trying to get loans. More often than not, the calls that I've been getting are, I can't get a loan. I've been perfect to my credit score. I made every one of my payments, and I can't get a loan. And my bank just pulled my credit line. So you're one of one voice when there are hundreds of others in the other perspective saying that banks are tightening standards too much. Markets are pretty efficient after they made a mess, <laughs> right? So more often than not, people are saying that banks are being too tough right now. And what I say to people is that, as I mentioned in my talk, in recessions, underwriting standards tighten and borrowers get more nervous about taking on. So you see credit levels falling. So we want markets to find the right balance. We don't want them to be too loose right now. We want people to be able to get loans, but we also want them to be prudent. So I, I don't have a better answer for you than that. Um, I'm surprised, because what I was hearing is that you know, the, the crisis really reached a fever pitch around Christmas time of 07. And underwriting standards at most banks had really ratcheted up at that point, especially in housing markets. Now it's the other classes of loans where people are continuing to tighten standards. Other questions? Right here. You, know, you talked a little bit earlier about the need to delever, but the TAUF program itself is just another form of leverage. Uh, so isn't it just this cycle? You're just, cre you're just moving leverage from the banks onto private investors' balance sheets. Well, we're moving, <clears throat> in this case, we're moving leverage to the federal government's balance sheet. Well, okay, <clears throat> federal government's balance sheet, yeah. So again, this is all about the, the nature of the adjustment. We need to deleverage. But what's the speed at which that deleveraging takes place? And how damaging is that deleveraging process to our broader economy while we go reach a new equilibrium? So if the government, if the Fed and Treasury did nothing, markets would find their own equilibrium. But it could have been incredibly damaging to our economy while they got there. So things like the TALF are trying to provide a more graceful approach to those new equilibriums. Things like the TALF are designed to be very expensive relative to what normal market conditions provide, that cost of that leverage, as an example, so that when markets begin to heal, those programs will unwind themselves and the private sector will return to using their other sources of leverage. So again, I'm not, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. It is another source of leverage. But again, it's about trying to find a graceful approach to this new equilibrium. Did I answer your question? Well, yeah, but when, when an 
when the program unwinds, you're saying the hope is at the end it equals the, it reaches that equilibrium, and that the government itself doesn't want that equilibrium reached too quickly, which could be damaging. Correct. What's the problem about it, though? What, I mean, that's what I don't understand in the market. What's the problem of having that big drop and then having private investors come in at that point and and meet it? Private investors have a lot of cash, and they are using the TAUF as well as other programs, as well as just private equity funds and their own investments to buy cheap assets. When it gets too cheap, they're coming in and they buy it, and then that's a fair price. Sure. The, the problem is when – look at what happened to us in the fall. So in the first – six months of the crisis, the fall of 07, our uh, constant message was we were pounding on banks, raise capital, recognize losses, raise capital, recognize losses, hoping that the private sector could deal with this adjustment on its own through private capital coming in, doing exactly as you said. But at some point, the private sector got too fearful and pulled back from the financial system and were unwilling to come in at virtually any price. And when the private sector is unwilling to come in at virtually any price, the price plummets and you can effectively render your financial system insolvent and collapse the financial system. And so when, again, within bounds of reasonably normal market conditions, what you're describing works perfectly. But when the private sector has such fear in it that the market just completely collapses, then the damage to our system can be catastrophic. And that's not a risk we were willing to take. Others? Neil, I was wondering, a lot of the economists have predicted that the subprime, uh, the subprime mar mortgage market was roughly two to three trillion, whereas the TARP money that you have handed out is around 700 billion. Do you see the two to three trillion number close, or do you think the 700 billion that you have put in has sort of plugged, plugged the bleeding for now? Well, <clears throat> TARP was $700 billion, of which roughly 400 has been spent, meaning either cash out the door or contractually committed, and around $200 billion more has been allocated to various programs, leaving about $100 billion roughly unallocated. It's important to remember, when you put in a dollar of equity, because banks are leveraged, that's roughly equivalent to buying $10 of assets. So it's not apples and apples to say $700 billion of TARP and 2 or $3 trillion of assets because of the leverage effect, number one. Number two, we're using... TARP is one of many tools that we're using to try to stabilize the system. Right? The Federal Reserve has massively expanded its balance sheet by one or two trillion dollars supporting various asset markets. You have the TARP, <clears throat> you have the FDIC debt guarantee, which has guaranteed several hundred billion dollars of bank debt. So combined, we're talking about massive amounts of resources going at stabilizing the system. And so looking at subprime is important, looking at mortgages in general are important, but all of our programs are designed at getting various components of the credit markets functioning again. Um, thank you very much for your presentation tonight. It's been just great. Uh, the failure of our regulatory authorities is staggering in this crisis. And the failure of the credit rating authorities is staggering, in, at least in my view. Given how difficult it is to redo those organizations, especially under the pressure of politics that have lobbying groups trying to minimize the real impact. Is there anything that we can do, is there anything citizens can do to try to give government the backbone it needs to really change these regulatory authorities, fix the, the credit rating, which are private organizations? But those, those organizations' failures um, ha are, have really um, – we will be back in the soup if we don't strengthen those, those, those institutions. <clears throat> I think it's a great question. You know, I look, at, I look at the rating agencies a lot like I look at sell-side equity research, which you should, you should know what you're getting, right? No offense, but you should know what you're getting and who they're representing and who pays their salaries. Now, I don't put disproportionate blame on the rating agencies only because Every one of their models, and every one of the bank's models, and every one of the investor's models all had the same assumption. Home prices only go up. And if home prices only go up, those models are brilliant. But when that, when that fundamental assumption is wrong, all those models don't work anymore. And so I'm 
I don't know how you design a regulatory system or a um, rating agency system that is going to be able to push back against a belief that the entire country shares. Think about it, if you were a regulator, the entire country believes that owning a home is the American dream for every American, and we all believe that home prices only go up, and you're somehow that regulator who's gonna stand up and say, no, 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 I know better, and you gotta trust me. That's a really tough thing to do. I'm not saying it's impossible. So I guess what I would say is having an active dialogue with your representatives and your leaders and demanding that, and I don't know how to do this, but demanding that they lead, that they not just reflect the current emotion that we're all feeling and the excitement that we're feeling about this market or tech stocks or whatnot. It's a really hard thing that I have not heard a good solution to, but I think the best thing I can say is the American people demanding that their leaders in Washington lead. That's, that's a hard thing. Anyway, thank you all very much. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>